Hello, today our guest is Professor Nigel Bigar. How are you doing, Nigel? I'm doing well, thanks, Lipton, here in Oxford. So, Nigel, today we will be talking about the British Empire, the ethics of empire and reparations. But before we begin our discussion, Nigel, please tell us a little about your program, Ethics and Empire. Uh, thank you, Lipton. So this um, is a collaborative program um, which was started about uh, three years ago. And it's designed to look at the phenomenon of empire from uh, the ancient period to the modern, from uh, China to Europe. And um, it's, it, it wants to look at the way in which people in the past have evaluated empire morally, um, uh, simply to, to, to see what sense they made of empire. And uh, I mean, nowadays, uh, certainly in the West, we tend to think of empire as being uh, morally insupportable. But in the past, um, that, that's not the way many people thought about it. So it, it's, it's trying, to, trying to see how in the past people have uh, thought about empire as a political phenomenon and, uh, and how they've, in what terms they have thought about it morally. All right. So Nigel, was your program attacked? Yes, it was. In, in uh, late 2017, um, first of all, I, I published uh, an article in the London Times, um, which argued what I thought was a, a pretty moderate, um, um, unobjectionable position, namely that the British Empire um, contains both good and bad, contains reasons for Britons to feel both uh, shame and pride, that's to say both shame and pride. Um, and then a week later, I published uh, online uh, a description of the Ethics and Empire project that had begun um, about uh, um, four or five months earlier. And a week after that, the first of three uh, online denunciations appeared in the space of a week. And uh, my uh, main historian collaborator on the project, the Ethics and Empire project, resigned within four days. Um, and I had my name in the, in the uh, newspapers in, in the UK here for about three or four weeks um, every day. Um, so yes, it, it was attacked. Um, but one, one, thing, one thing that uh, I noticed was that my attackers um, didn't seem to realize that the Ethics and Empire project was not designed to defend any particular empire. Um, it was designed to, uh, as I say, examine how in the past people have thought about empire ethically. But I suppose here was the thing, uh, I did not, and this, this was explicit in the account I gave online, uh, I did not assume that empire is always and everywhere uh, morally illegitimate. I, I assume that uh, in certain times or places, empire was a sufficiently morally legitimate form of, of government. And I think it was that, uh, that, that refusal to damn empire always and everywhere that uh, um, irritated uh, my critics. But Nigel, empires can result in the creation of stronger states, better institutions and urbanization. So for example, when the Vikings conquered some groups, they built cities. Empire is not necessarily bad in all cases as we're agreeing. And another issue is that the British should be proud of their history. The Chinese are proud of their history. You cannot go to China and tell people not to teach Confucius. So why are Europeans <laughs> so different? <laughs> Well, I, I agree with you, Lipton. I, I, um, one thing we've discovered in our uh, Ethics and Empire project so far is that um, before the modern period, um, the Chinese, for example, and even um, in the Muslim world, uh, did not regard empire as a remarkable phenomenon at all. So you, you will find um, 
treatises in 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 China and um, um, Arabic treatises that reflect on good and bad government, uh, what what makes a virtuous ruler and what makes a, a an unvirtuous ruler, uh, but they regarded empire as a uh, as a political form as completely unremarkable. They took it for granted. The only question was, uh, is the emperor virtuous or not? Exactly. Was, uh, give, given the fact that we in, we in, in the modern West uh, um, tend to regard empire as, as illegitimate, it's quite surprising to find in the past people regarded it as normal. Exactly. They were interested in knowing that the emperor had the mandate of heaven. The Chinese culture cares about stability, not disruption or innovation. So, for example, some like to point out that China has a rich history of proto-liberal thought. But the issue is, is this. Legalism became popular in China. China, even today, according to serious academics, is a rule by law state, not a rule of law state. Yes. Yes. No, that, that point about stability is, is really important because... Uh, one of the benefits of empire, and we, we saw that actually with the Austro-Hungarian Empire in Europe and when it collapsed, one of the benefits of empire is it provides, us, provides an overarching political authority that can um, transcend uh, ethnic differences and ethnic tensions and control them. Um, um, and, and one of the effects of, of the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the end of the First World War was that, yes, we get lots of, of um, new states arising in Eastern and Central Europe, but they had real problems with minorities. And, and uh, that was one of the causes, of course, of the Second World War, when you've got ethnic Germans trapped in Czechoslovakia, uh, giving uh, Nazi Germany a reason to invade. So um, I agree with you, uh, empire as a kind of um, trans-ethnic uh, political organization does uh, often provide the benefit of peace. So here's, here's another interesting example. Um, in 1879, the British uh, conquered the uh, Zulu kingdom in South Africa. And uh, after that, they divided the kingdom into 13 little statelets. One of the statelets was ruled by a white man. The other nine were ruled by, uh, by Zulu. And after a while, what happened was these little statelets started to um, um, started to, to grate against each other, and there was conflict between them. And the Zulus said to the British, "Look, we, we understand the right of conquest. Uh, you conquered us. Fine. Uh, we did that to other peoples. Um, so you conquered us. So now, please, would you rule us? In other words, impose an imperial authority." It will stop us fighting each other. Um, and so that, that, that uh, often can be um, uh, a major benefit of an overarching imperial authority that, that uh, moderates tensions between different ethnic groups. Yes, Deepak Lala makes a similar point in his book, noting that after some African kingdoms became independent, they requested to be ruled by the British again. The British not only imposed law and order and lowered crime in many territories, but white people from the West also encourage hygiene practices. That's an important issue. Health is quite interesting in the creation of empire and getting people to accept modern medicine. Yes, well, in, 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 of course, the in the modern period, um, when, when Europeans pitched up on the coasts of North America or in, in South Africa, um, I mean, they, they, they um, found themselves encountering peoples who, and of course in Australia too, peoples who, at least in terms of um, modern science and technology, were, were um, very underdeveloped. Uh, I mean, some of them uh, would have been classified as, as virtually in the Stone Age. I think in uh, the, the Aboriginals in Australia would be classified by anthropologists as virtually the Stone Age. In South Africa, the Iron Age. So in terms of the gulf, in terms of scientific and technological knowledge and expertise was vast. 
And so part of the story of, of European empires is the, the uh, encountering uh, of the modern world uh, with um, societies that were um, very, very unmodern. And so, yes, um, um, the British Empire and other European empires, among other things, uh, brought modern medicine uh, to uh, different parts of the world, not least Africa. And uh, one of the benefits was to eradicate, to begin to eradicate disease. Um, um, yeah. Yes, and the missionaries in places like Naomi and other parts of Africa also oppose human sacrifice. That's another important issue. Yeah, that's right. So, um, I mean, that, that yes. So, so in West Africa in particular, um, uh, for example, the Kingdom of Benin and others. Yes. Um, um, but I think not just Benin, but, 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 but more broadly, um, uh, Af uh, African kingdoms uh, did trade slaves. Uh, for, they, they often fought other African peoples and took prisoners who became slaves. Um, sometimes they sold them to, to the Arabs. Um, this, was long, this was long before the Europeans arrived. And, um, but, but sometimes they, they kept slaves and uh, on occasions, uh, particularly uh, to mark uh, royal occasions, um, to mark uh, in particular royal funerals, um, slaves would often be buried alive with their masters, the idea In Benin, that, they... that was practicing in the Benin Empire. Is that right? Yes. Is that right? And yes. uh, okay. the Asante Empire also engaged in sacrificing slaves. And yeah. the, the Naomi Empire was extremely passionate about sac sacrificing people because they argued that Naomi was a great military empire. And that was linked to its culture of warfare. Yes, yes. And so, so one of, I mean, one of the rationales for uh, British um, um, encroachment on West Africa and this includes the Kingdom of Benin in 1897, was to stop the practice of, of human sacrifice as well as, as the slave trade. Um, and this is something that, that for example, um, Sir Hilary Beckles, um, who wrote this book, uh, Britain's Black Debt, um, I mean, he argues that uh, um, African chiefs, African chiefs, um, were generally opposed to, to trading in slaves and only uh, uh, got involved in slave trading because the Europeans forced them. Not but true. This is, this is not true. Uh, and I've, I'm not an expert on this, but I've spoken to, um, uh, to one eminent historian of the transatlantic slave trade and also one expert in West African history. And both of them say there's no evidence uh, of, of, of duress here. And the evidence is that African chiefs were trading slaves with Arabs a long time before the Europeans arrived. Robin Law is an excellent source. Ah, I, Rob, I, was, yes. I was referring to him. So yes. you, you know of Robin, do you? Yes, Robin, Rob, Rob, Robin Law is, is a brilliant man and he's very balanced and, and objective. But yes. sl slavery was an institution in Africa. Boniface I. Obituary is, is a specialist, and he argues that slavery was the norm in African territories like Asante and Naomi. And other African historians have written on the history of slavery and the history of African imperialism. Yes. 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 So, well, certainly, so, it did, in terms of empires, I mean, you're quite right. I mean, they, if I remember rightly, um, uh, in West Africa, you, you have, um, was it the Fulani Empire? And yes. the Ashanti also had their own empire. And then, of course, the Zulu in the 1820s of Africa, uh, they, they, they broke out of Zululand and, and uh, moved westward. The Ndebele ended up in, in um, what's now southern Rhodesia. And um, the, the, the Africans refer to that period as the Mfikani. Yes, yes, Mfikani. Catastrophe. Yes. When, when, when African peoples were spent were sent flying uh, south and north and, and west because of the Zulu expansion. Yes, and Jan Van Sina, the European historian, he's a good source for people who are interested in exploring the history of Central and East Africa. His, his books are quite yes. fascinating. But yes. Yes. Nigel, 
we're going to continue this discussion, but now I would like to talk about the British Empire. What was the ideological driving force behind the British Empire? Well, that, that's a very interesting question. And I think the first thing to say is, um, I mean, people often talk about the British Empire as a project, and they talk about the imperial ideology, but th that implies that there was a kind of single aim. And this was a, a project as if someone had woken up in London one morning and said, ooh, let's go and conquer the world. Um, it didn't happen like that. And, and most empires don't happen like that. It happened uh, piecemeal. It happened in stages. So, I mean, there were many motives for British empire. And right at the beginning in the 1500s, when um, uh, British or English uh, sailors ended up uh, establishing posts on the coast of North America. I mean, why were they there? Well, they were there as part of an operation uh, to fend off Spanish imperialism, <laughs> because at that point, England wasn't an empire, um, but it was being threatened by imperial Spain. So ironically, um, some of the earliest origins of the British Empire lie in anti-imperial uh, defense. Um, and then after that, the, probably the, the, next, uh, um, the next most um, uh, important motive was trade. Uh, so you, you have the East Indian Company being chartered in the 1500s to trade with India. It, it ends up trading as far east as, as Hong Kong. And, and then you have, you, you've got traders out in, in remote parts and they end up being threatened. So they begin to establish defenses and they make alliances with local people. Uh, and and um, in order to pacify the countryside, they develop private armies. That's how the East India Company began to move into India. It was mainly trade and then the need to defend trade. Um, and then in the 19th century, you've got hundreds of thousands of people from the British Isles, Ireland, Scotland, England, migrating in search of a better life. Uh, so, so th in a sense, there was no there was no ideology. It was a variety of different motives. But uh, um, here, here's one one place where ideology begins to enter the picture. Lipton, um, starting with the movement to abolish the slave trade, uh, you have, if you like, a an ideology of Christian humanitarianism. Uh, starting in the 1780s, the Society to Abolish the Slave Trade was founded in 1787. And as you know well, uh, that ended up 20 years later in, in succeeding in persuading the British Parliament to stop the slave trade and then um, 20 plus years later to abolish slavery within the empire. But then this ideology of Christian humanitarianism continues. Um, the British didn't just abolish slavery in the empire, they spent the next 100, 150 years until the end of the empire in the, in the 1960s, uh, suppressing slave trade and slavery all over the world from Latin America, the Atlantic, Africa, Indian Ocean, Asia, Indonesia. Um, so so the, 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 there grew up in the 19th century, uh, largely I think due to evangelical Christianity, uh, an ideology of humanitarianism, where among other things, the, the mission of the empire is to enable uh, peoples who uh, were not uh, so developed to develop themselves and eventually to be able to rule themselves uh, in a sufficiently just and stable manner. Uh, so you'll find um, it's remarkable in, in 1820s, uh, the, the, uh, the, the three governors of Calcutta, Madras and Bombay are all Scotsmen. And in the 1820s, uh, you will find every single one of them saying, look, there's no way the British can stay in India forever. Uh, all we can hope to do is to um, um, implant in India, in the parts of India we control, sufficiently stable and decent government. When we've done that, when the Indian people can rule themselves, we should leave with grace and in friendship. Uh, and that was back in the 1820s. Uh, so, so you're right, there was an ideology which grew up uh, um, in the 19th century, but it was humanitarian 
and, and liberal. For sure, the empire didn't always live up to its, its ideals, but there was that ideology which remained uh, central. Yes, I, I, I agree with your response. But Nigel, there is a question that's particularly interesting. Why did anti-imperialism emerge in the West? And I'm, and I'm referring to both the UK and America. Westerners at a point wanted to get rid of empire for both economic and moral reasons. And that's unusual. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I think a, a number of different factors were at play. I mean, the, as I say, the empire didn't always live up to its ideals. And so it's always had, uh, it's always had critics Actually, from both the right and the left. Yes, so the right and the left. Was, John Obson was one person who straddled both the right and the left yeah. in a sense. Yeah, and then but Edmund, Edmund Burke, of course, back in the 1700s, was was quite critical of, of particularly of imperial interference in, in Indian culture. Um, um, but then, then I think um, the, there was the emergence, first of all, in, in India uh, of... Um, um, Indian nationalism starting in the 1880s with the foundation of the of Congress and it, it initially the the aims of of this nationalist movement uh, was to uh, um, um, move what was to press for more and more Indian involvement in the government of India uh, with a view to um, uh, developing in India into a uh, a, 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 um, a, a an autonomous part of the British Empire in the same way that Canada and Australia and New Zealand and South Africa uh, uh, became increasingly autonomous from uh, 1867 till the 1930s. So the idea was India would follow in that in that path. And in London, it was accepted by certainly by 1917 that uh, Britain would prepare India for self-government, but um, um, nationalists, uh, for one reason or another, uh, in India and, and later in, in Africa, uh, were not always very patient. Um, um, and um, independent government for India and African colonies came about much more rapidly than many British people thought desirable. And even and now, looking back at the history, particularly of post-colonial Africa, uh, a, a number of people uh, do think it would have been wiser if people had been more patient for the British to stay longer uh, and for um, um, African colonies to develop more slowly. So that, 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 that was one of the, one of the kind of um, forces that led to um, the dissolution of empire. And there were lots of people in Britain, particularly on the left, uh, who, who supported uh, nationalist movements. Uh, the other reason was, frankly, the, uh, in particular, the Second World War, um, as you know, um, fighting Nazism and, and Imperial Japan in 39 to 45 um, uh, exhausted Britain. I mean, we were, we were bankrupt. We were in debt to, to the US. Uh, so there was a sense of exhaustion. And uh, also America, immediately after the Second World War, uh, given its own history, was not inclined to support uh, Britain in retaining its empire. Um, and uh, so um, for those reasons, uh, um, um, the British, I think, decided to uh, let go of the empire uh, as peacefully and orderly as they could. Uh, of course, the, the Americans uh, a few years later changed their minds a bit when they realized that uh, the empire or the remnant of it uh, could be useful in, a, in, in helping to um, contain Soviet Russia. Yes. But by then it was too late. By then it was too late. Yes, and Nigel, in the British Parliament, people debated sl slavery in a cogent manner. The language of these debates were often imbued with morality. And secondly, mercantilism was also heavily debated. Some were pro-protectionism, others, others were not. So again, the British Empire on average appears to be quite balanced. Wouldn't you agree? 
Balance in what sense? In the uh, sense, in, in, in the sense that though the purpose of building an empire obviously is to subjugate foreign peoples, they cared about morality, economics, and the lives of people in the colonies. Yes, although I would say the the, the purpose, the, the main purpose of the British Empire was not to, sub, to subjugate peoples, because uh, if you look at the history of the empire, um, certainly in from the 19th century onwards, uh, London is is quite reluctant to get get involved in the business of ruling other peoples because it's expensive, <laughs> um, and so you know so you find the Zulus in 1879 saying to London, "Will you please come and govern us?" Because you know you, you've you've removed the Zulu kingdom, you divided us up, and we're now warring with each other. We need someone to govern us, and London was very reluctant to do it because it it cost money, um, and um, so so London on the whole. Was interested in trade, and uh, the British Empire from the 1840s was in favour of free trade, and the subjugation of peoples was a secondary matter. It, it, it only became rational for the empire to subjugate peoples uh, when it was necessary, for example, uh, to, to to pacify bits of India uh, where where um, um, the the Mughal Empire had collapsed and there was anarchy. And the thing about anarchy is um, it hinders trade. People, people uh, become impoverished. They can't buy stuff. Uh, you, you can't, you can't um, uh, trade your wares because it's not safe. And so uh, in that case, um, the, the imposition of rule became a condition of trade. Um, so I think that um, on the whole, the British Empire was not strongly interested in, in imposing um, uh, their rule and other peoples. And in West Africa, in the case of Benin, for example, London was really reluctant to uh, send a military force against Benin until, until uh, um, the, the, um, the Kingdom of Benin slaughtered an, uh, an unarmed diplomatic mission sent in, in January 97. That was the precipitating factor. And even when the British did move in, they, they changed the regime, uh, they, they, they then imposed a form of indirect rule. So um, African uh, chiefs were permitted to carry on ruling their peoples under certain conditions and, and under certain constraints, but the British on the whole didn't want to get deeply involved. Um, uh, but when they did, uh, I mean, trade was certainly a major consideration, but even there, um, I mean, from the 1840s onwards, there was this, and this was part of the ideology, uh, this, this uh, belief that um, in order to suppress the slave trade in Africa, um, you, have to, you, have to, you have to substitute some other kind of trade. Uh, so if you don't want Africans to trade in people, you need to develop other forms of trade they can uh, make a living from. And so the idea that, um, uh, in order to suppress slavery, uh, the slave trade, that, that commerce needed to be promoted. And with commerce would come the seeds of wider uh, civilization. David Livingstone, the famous Scottish missionary, uh, was uh, one of those who believed this. And that's why he was uh, keen to develop, if possible, um, the development of, of um, the production of cotton in, in uh, South and uh, South uh, East Africa. Um, so um, commerce, I think, was, was, was a major driver. But, but, but once, once the British did end up uh, ruling peoples, yes, partly through missionaries, partly through humanitarian lobby groups in London, uh, there was a sense that if, we have, if we're going to rule peoples, we do have to try and rule them well. Uh, and that meant um, um, suppressing slavery, suppressing um, um, human sacrifice, suppressing uh, the, uh, the practice of female infanticide in India. And uh, the, although uh, colonial governments were not, um, then as now, uh, um, the, 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 the assumption was that private enterprise should drive economic development um, and um, colonial governments themselves didn't invest a lot in education, 
uh, but they did allow uh, private entrepreneurs and missionaries to come in and to begin to develop uh, education in, in their colonies. Yes, and Nigel, there was also a, a tendency of the British to abolish slavery and the slave trade upon conquering a territory. They abolished the slave trade on the Gold Coast, for example, and eventually slavery, because of the influence of the British, became irrelevant in the Sokoto Caliphate. Why don't we talk about these issues? <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's, that's an interesting question. I mean, we, we so in, in here in the West, in, in the UK and in America, um, the focus of the anti-colonialists who right now are, are on the left, uh, the, the decolonizers, the Black Lives Matter movement, the Rosemans Fall movement, the focus is on, is on um, British, European, American slavery. Um, no one wants to talk about African or Arab involvement in slavery. Um, so there is this strange, um, unbalanced and uh, questionable focus on uh, European involvement. And I think you asked, you know, why, why is this? Well, I think it's pretty obvious the reason is political. Um, in my experience of, of um, engaging with anti-colonialists, uh, starting with the Rosemans Fall movement here in Oxford, uh, in 2015-16 uh, is the truth is they aren't really interested in the truth about the history of the empire. Uh, historical truth is not the point. They are interested in, in using bits of it to leverage uh, liberal guilt. Exactly. Uh, in, order, in order to achieve certain ends, pol political ends. Is, is, that, is that how you understand it? Yes, I, I agree with you 100%. Why people want to cleanse themselves of guilt. And furthermore, if roads must fall, why do people accept the road scholarship? Shouldn't that fall? <laughs> yes, well, there's a, there's a bit of moral inconsistency there, isn't there? Um, uh, yes, yes, I, know, I, 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 I agree with that. And besides, why should roads fall if... Uh, if uh, KwaZulu Natal in in South Africa has just named uh, a bright new shiny airport after King Shaka, yes, and uh, uh, Shaka, of course, was responsible for the Zulu Empire, and I believe in the late 1820s did conduct at least one war that aimed at uh, at genocide. Yes. Um, so that, no, I, I I certainly agree with that, but it, it is interesting that. Um, it's become clear to me that um, the the the, um, the the passion with which, or the zeal with which, the anti-colonialist uh, critics operate, it, it's not about the truth about the past. Because if if you mention the truth, they simply ignore it and keep on shouting. Um, but but there's actually I find that um, a ground of some hope, Lipton, because uh, it seems to me that certainly in my own country here in the UK, that the, um, the effectiveness of the Black Lives Matter, Rose Must Fall decolonizing movement is based on two things. First of all, uh, their conviction uh, that, that colonialism equals slavery, uh, combined with um, uh, a majority who just don't know very much about the colonial past and uh, therefore don't have the, the resources with which to resist the zealots. So the combination of zeal and ignorance means that a zealous minority uh, appears to be dominant. But, but the, 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 the ground of hope, Lipton, is this, that the more, the more that people uh, stand up and point out the untruth of the uh, equation of British colonialism with slavery, the fact that uh, yes, the British were involved in uh, the slave trade and slavery for about 150 years from 1650, but also they were then involved in a consistent anti-slavery uh, endeavor around the world 
for another 150 years. Um, so, so, so it seems to me that if we can uh, keep broadcasting uh, the, the more complicated, morally ambiguous, not entirely bad truth about um, the British colonial experience, uh, then there, there is some hope that many of those who at the moment have no resources to resist the zealots uh, will start to resist. And the, the unreasonableness, uh, perhaps even the dishonesty of the zealots will become exposed. Yes, and Nigel, the hypocrisy of cultural transformation is quite dazzling. So for example, the Fulani people wage a jihad and they conquered the Hausa states of Nigeria. Upon doing so, they adopted some of the better practices, but they also changed the culture. People often contend that the British transformed or ruined the culture of Africa, but that is a consequence of empire. So what is the point of those complaints? I think they're pointless. Yes, well, that, that's, that's, that's a very interesting topic, the, the issue of, of culture. So it's, of course, uh, when, when modern Europeans, when modern British people pitch up in, in North America or Australia or Africa, they, they, they bring a culture that is in many respects, in terms of science, in terms, in terms of technology, and, and also, I think, in certain, uh, in certain ways, in terms of, if you like, uh, humane liberal mores, is in many respects superior. And what happens? Well, um, many native peoples in Africa are quite attracted to it. Exactly. Uh, so so uh, you find some people in Africa, particularly the um, particularly women, particularly young people, particularly uh, um, people at the lower end of the social spectrum, they find Christianity quite attractive. Um, uh, so, so, so one thing to say is um, there are some people who claim that Christianity and, and um, uh, modernity was simply imposed on unwilling peoples. It's not that simple, actually. Um, um, lots, of, lots of native peoples found aspects of what was brought to them really quite attractive. And um, you know, but so, so when they absorbed Christianity in, in, um, in Africa, and maybe I assume this is the same in, in the Caribbean, Lipton, uh, yes, it comes in European form and, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, Anglican missionaries teach um, um, Africans and, and Caribbeans to be Anglican, but not unsurprisingly, after a while, um, Anglican Christianity in Africa and the Caribbean looks a bit different from yes. Anglican Christianity in England. It's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and people, uh, and all over the world, even outside empires, people appropriate things they like in other cultures, but, th but they, this is the thing, appropriation means you make it your own. <laughs> and in the process of making it your own, you make it different from, what, from the way it was received. Um, and it was two way too, because it's not simply a matter of uh, British people um, imposing European, modern European culture on Indians and Africans and Australians and uh, Aboriginals and, and North Americans, um, particularly in the case of India, lots of British people found uh, Indian culture fascinating. Yes. Uh, and and so, so Indian culture has made its mark on British culture. Uh, so, uh, in in many respects, it was a two two way traffic, but that, that that's normal human cultural commerce. But even in the Caribbean, some planters would actually patronize slaves when they had parties. People like foreign culture, especially U U European. This is not unusual. Yes. And there is also a positive relationship between Christianity and development in Africa. This has been confirmed by many empirical studies. One of the popular studies w was done by Robert Woodbury and reviews have shown that for the most part is ideas stand, stand up to scrutiny. And yes. Nathan Nunn has also followed in that tr tradition. So I think that on, av on average, colonialism was a positive. So, 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 
uh, I'm aware of the Woodbury study, yeah. Lipton. Can you talk a bit more about what is it that he demonstrates? Yes, yeah, so, so Woodbury argues that there's a relationship between education and Protestant. So it's not specifically referring to British Protestant, but Protestant naturally because they encourage people to read Protestant. The Protestant movement is analytical and individualistic. They built institutions, they invested in women. It led to science and modernity. And he also argues that there was a correlation between per Protestant Christianity and democracy. But this has been disputed by some. However, on net, Many studies do argue that British colonies, on average, are more democratic. Academic outcomes in British colonies are also superior. And because of Britain's policy pertaining to trade, it was easier for British colonies to adjust to structural adjustment programs. Yes. Yes. OK. 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 Yeah. yeah. But just on, on the... On the on the culture, go back to the cultural uh, point, uh, Lipton. As you'll know, one of the um, uh, patriarchs of of the post-colonial uh, movement is Edward Said. Yes. <laughs> and um, um, the the Bible of post-colonialism is Said's Orientalism, and the the thesis of Orientalism is that um, when Europeans and and Brits uh, um, uh, uh, came across, in particular, Indian culture or Arab culture. Um, they they, um, they 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 dominated it, and and even when they absorbed it, they they kind of distorted it. Um, um, so, it was, it, 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 so so his his thesis is that that um, Western culture dominated and controlled these these um, um, uh, native Indian and and uh, Arabic cultures, but um, it, it's been shown, for example, Zaria Mazani has written uh, articles pointing out that uh, British Orientalists in India um, were responsible for recovering uh, ancient yes. Hindu traditions and texts, uh, um, which had been lost from sight, uh, and also uh, preserving ancient Hindu monuments. And uh, in his book, um, Thy, uh, thy hand, great anarch, um, Nira Chowdhury, who was the maverick um, uh, Indian um, man of letters who ended up uh, um, living in Oxford after uh, Indian independence. He made the point that um, uh, the, what the British Orientalists discovered was then uh, 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 en enabled Indian nationalism, as it were, to claim its own heritage. Uh, and to assert it against uh, European cultural dominance. So uh, ironically, in the eyes of, of Chowdhury, it was British Orientalists uh, who um, ended up uh, serving inadvertently Indian nationalism. So uh, the, the, um, the, 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 the kind of um, the story that Saeed tells of, of, of dominance and distortion um, is not the whole story. Um, and, and that's one of the main assumptions of, of post-colonial theory. But that's an excellent point. We do know that Europeans invented many modern methods. So, for example, they, 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 they went to Egypt and they started to study ancient societies. So Egyptology, that's an invention of U Europeans. And it's... Yes. it's you make you and it's also the same for Middle Eastern cultures. They yes. studied Assyria. So what you're saying is true. And yeah. usually when there is a marriage between indigenous cultures and European cultures, the European culture tends to die. So for example, in Jamaica, people often argue that colonialism destroyed Afro-Jamaican culture. That is not true. Jamaican Blacks retain significant chunks of Afro-Jamaican culture. So African stories are popular in, in, in Jamaica. African fables, African dances are also pop popular. We, however, we don't pay significant attention to African cuisine. But on average, the European culture in the Caribbean died. 
Is that right? Yes. The, 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 uh, people in the Caribbean don't care about, can't, they can't tell you about African stories. So, for example, a Nancy story is very popu popular. And our language is also influenced by various Nigerian dialects. So, for example, Bakra is a Nigerian word. So the European culture did not su survive I in Jamaica. We speak English. English is the say, official you, you, language. You speak English. That's, yes, that's one big but the, the European <laughs> culture did not su survive. And in right. Jamaica, the British did research on our culture. So for example, people like Edward Long wrote on the Caribbean, so did Brian Edwards. And there's someone called James Stark, a white man he wrote uh, on J Jamaica. So the, the, the British were very interested in Jamaican culture. They collected data on Jamaican botany, etc. Because yeah. Europeans are tolerant to foreign cultures. European Europe, the culture of Europe is not very ethnocentric. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, yes. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, I think I think that the the, the way in which post colonialists think about uh, the cultural encounter between Europe and, and uh, Africa, and North America, and Australia, Middle East, uh, it's, it's, um, it's kind of one dimensional uh, because it doesn't take into account the fact that n no doubt um, colonial officials uh, did want to understand the cultures and society of peoples they ruled because they wanted to be able to rule effectively, though, you know, what's wrong with that? Um, but in addition to that, um, I mean, human beings are curious and, and even British officials, members of the Indian Civil Service were genuinely curious and fascinated and admiring sometimes of uh, native cultures. And that's what you would expect. Human beings are often curious. Um, so, but so the, the story that the post-colonialists tell about um, uh, cultural appropriation as as simply a form of domination and distortion is uh, uh, just implausible. Yes, it, it, it doesn't make much sense any at all. But but Nigel, the issue of reparations that has become quite popular in the Caribbean, America, and in England. Do you support reparations? Uh, not in the case of slavery. Um, I mean, I think that the, 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 the kind of um, the, the primary case uh, of um, reparations would be, and I think in, in discussions of reparations, this is the case, uh, would be um, reparations made uh, by um, Germany uh, to Jewish families after the Second World War, um, um, restoring property to uh, those Jew Jews who survived, or the, although the, the, the descendants of those who were killed during the Second World War. Uh, now, in that case, it was clear uh, what had been taken, who had taken it, and who it was taken from. Um, and it was clear partly because um, there was a very short elapse of time between the, the crime of seizing Jewish property and the plans for reparation. So um, um, in that case, reparations make sense. And, and the principle, the principle that uh, if one does wrong, one should try and put it right is, is a good principle. But the, the problem with um, the argument for uh, reparations for slavery the main problem is this happened 200 years ago. <laughs> um, and um, between the decision to abolish the slave trade in 1807 and then uh, slavery itself throughout the empire in 1833, uh, between then and now is 150, 120 years of anti-slavery. So, so the British uh, empire was committed uh, to abolish the slave trade across the Atlantic, across the Indian Ocean. Nigel, um, Nigel, for in, in one of your articles, you refer to a study done by Pape, P-A-P-E, and Pape and his yes. colleague argued that 
abolishing the slave trade was very expensive. Well, what they actually, what they actually said was yeah. uh, the, the effort to, su to suppress the transatlantic slave trade between 1807 and 67, they said, quote, it was the most expensive example of costly international moral action in recorded modern history, is what they said. Uh, so it was very expensive. Um, the Royal Navy, I think, is reckoned to have lost 17,000 sailors to the effort. Uh, at one point, I think in about 1830, 40, 13% um, of the manpower of the Royal Navy uh, was devoted to patrolling the west coast of Africa to stop uh, uh, slave traffic. And um, some have, have estimated that uh, the British spent as much uh, suppressing the transatlantic slave trade, trade in the 50 years or so between 1816 and 62 as they had earned in profits during the same length of time leading up to 1807. So, you know, if, if, if we're going to talk about reparations, you can say, if you, you can say that the, the British owe a debt, but then, then there's also uh, a fair amount in the credit uh, um, column as well. So how are you going to balance up the debt, however you estimate it, uh, with the uh, investment for a century and a half in anti-slavery is a problem. And then we've already talked about, haven't we, the fact that um, it wasn't just the British who were involved in uh, trading Africans. It was Africans. And the Arabs. <laughs> so, the Arabs. And the Arabs. So, yes. so there's a question of equity here. If you're going to come after the Brits, then you need to go after the descendants of the African chiefs and the Arab slave traders and start demanding repar reparations from, from them. So, so, so trying to, as it were, rectify history at this distance is it seems to me impossibly complicated um, and, and probably not capable of being done rationally. Um, so I think that, um, um, I think that, that um, rather than, than talking in terms of reparations for slavery, the way to go about it is this, forget about the past, we can't undo the past. What we can do is, is try and improve the present. So if Caribbean nations uh, are suffering in some way, let's say um, that they, they need help with, with improving the quality of health or education, um, then, then Britain is a wealthy and prosperous country. Um, and it's quite right that, that those who are rich and have more than they need should help those <coughs> uh, who are poorer. Britain can't help everybody. We've got to choose who we help. But because of our historic uh, uh, links with the Caribbean, and indeed, in the case of some Caribbean countries, our continuing constitutional association, um, there's a good argument that Britain should devote uh, um, um, its international aid, especially to helping uh, the Caribbean and other former colonies like it. So I, I'd rather we focused on present problems than trying to um, rectify the past 200 years ago. Yeah. But, but Nigel, Jamaica is a major beneficiary of foreign aid from the UK and other states in Europe. You, the European Union has provided aid to Jamaica to invest in the banana sector, to invest in the sugar sector, to build the mining sector, and Jamaica also benefits from capacity building programs sponsored by the UK. However, the research indicates that foreign aid has failed to induce growth in the developing world. And based on my own research and analyses, J Jamaica has not managed aid efficiently. So for example, instead of accepting aid from the EU to save a dead sector, we should use those funds to invest in science and technology or other useful methods of development. So European aid has been financing sectors that are no longer relevant and the Jamaican state has been a bystander in this process. So, so Europe is already providing Jamaica with aid, but aid as the evidence suggests 
cannot buy growth if it's not used productively. So again, I, I, under, I understand the moral argument in favor of aid, but the problems in the developing world are bigger than foreign aid. And the fact that the UK and the European Union are providing aid to countries in the Caribbean is also evidence of reparations. If you're already getting aid, why do you want further reparation? Yeah, well, that, that's that's a, a very good point. Uh, the, the, the earlier point about um, the effect, effectiveness of aid uh, is one I've heard made more generally, uh, particularly in Africa. And as I understand it, Lipton, uh, the, the problem is that certainly in the past, the aid has been funneled through states and the states are often corrupt yes uh, or, or they're not efficient um and so the effect that so so the aid is not used effectively it doesn't reach what it needs to reach as i understand it um more recently um certainly um uh, non-governmental aid and, and maybe governmental aid too I, I just don't know uh has been funneled as it were has by has tried to bypass states and go straight to uh, to, to, to the ground, as it were, um, in, in, a, in the hope of, of making it more uh, directly effective and productive. But in, in Jamaica and, and the Caribbean, what has been the problem with, I mean, what, what, why is it that aid is not effective? Okay, so for example, agriculture is not the pillar of a modern society. Because of globalization, the Europeans experience guilt. So they have been financing sugar and banana. So therefore, the aid funds are being channeled into avenues that are not very productive. That's the first issue. There's a big difference between- And, 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 and look to the, is that because of decisions made by the Jamaican government? I, I guess the Jamaican, hold on, so for example, because of the, the issue of re-globalization, the aid schemes are designed to achieve a particular objective, but Jamaican politicians have constituencies and some of these people are dependent on sugar and banana. And Jamaica is still a very populous country, unlike the French and the British who are yet to get rid of old corruption. So if you're a Jamaican politician, it makes more sense to talk about saving agriculture than building a research institute. Yes. So yes. it's a catch-22. So, so, so what would need to happen uh, for um, um, European and British funds to, to be put behind what you think it should be put behind, namely uh, 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 scientific and technological research? Yes. So for example... So, but, 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 uh, what's necessary to make that happen? What's necessary to make that happen? happen political will europeans are very decent people they, they listen to the, to the jamaican government and they're willing to help us but the jamaican government is willing to move the country forward i listen to european diplomats they're serious about trade and development and sometimes diplomats will say jamaica should invest in research and development because many of our plants have medicinal quality and we know this because of local research and international research yet we don't have a boom in pharmaceutical industry there, we don't have a science foundation there's not a serious public science foundation or a private science foundation apparently there is some research foundation but it doesn't have a website and i can't get information uh, to, to inform my opinion just going back to, to reparations for a moment, yeah. I, I'd like to hear what you have to say about it, because uh, uh, I've read Hilary Beckel's book, uh, uh, Britain's Black Dead, Arguing for Reparations. In my opinion, it's not a very good book. But, but uh, in Jamaica and uh, elsewhere in the, in the uh, Caribbean, um, how strong is support for uh, okay. Uh, reparations? Okay, so... I'm yet to see a, a study noting that X percent of people in the Caribbean are Jamaica support reparations, but I can tell you this. The establishment is in favor of reparation because it allows wealthy Blacks to extract resources from white institutions. The University of the West Indies, in partnership with a foreign university, got funds to build the Center for Reparation Research, and the center is interested in studying 
pro reparation programs. In other words, it's getting money to study reparations and to justify it. And I think that is stupid. But the yeah. average person may not care about reparations. However, elites rule society, they set the tone. So maybe eventually ordinary people will support re reparations. But reparations is based on a faulty premise. According to one study, a recent study, surveying centuries of British economic growth, economic growth in England is linked to innovation and population growth. Another economist, C. Nick Arley, contends that even without the, trans the transatlantic trade, the British would invest in other markets. And Barbara Solo, whose estimates are quite large, argues that slavery, though it contributed to the British economy was not crucial. So our estimates are not large enough to dispute the claim that slavery did not build England. So the activists are, are building their argument on this dubious narrative, Blacks built Britain. No, they didn't. Obviously, workers built Britain, Black people and white people worked, but slavery did not build, did not build Britain. It was yes, expensive. That, that, that's right. I, I, and you, you're quite right. I mean, the, the, the argument that uh, uh, Britain's wealth is, is built on slavery is one that's being propagated by uh, many. Um, yeah. And in this country, too. Um, uh, but, but, but you're quite right. I mean, I, I've, I've written a, 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 um, an essay on, on slavery. And, and sorry, sorry to cut it, but Engerman, you can go back to his, to his essay. The gains of the slave trade were small. And a new study said that the plantation complex, the value of the component was over 11%, but relatively that's also small. But you may continue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, no, just just to agree with that. Um, I, I mean, you know, and, and maybe maybe your listeners know about uh, Eric Williams' yes. uh, uh, famous uh, 1944 claim that profits from the slave trade made uh, a contribution to uh, Britain's industrial revolution. Uh, well, um, writing writing in I think about 19, uh, 2010 or thereabouts, uh, the doyen of um, uh, studies of, of the transatlantic slave trade, uh, David Brion Davis, the American yeah. scholar, he said that that claim by Williams, quote, has now been wholly discredited by other scholars. Yes. Uh, so, yes, it's true that, of course, slavery made a contribution to Britain's industrial takeoff, but no, it, it was technological innovation uh, uh, that primarily uh, um, motivated it. Yes, and, and even if we follow the argument of James Robin Robinson, slavery affected British development through the channel of institutions. Because of the slave trade, people became pro-business, pro-market, and created institutions that were designed to create wealth. So it affects the slave yes. trade yes. affected development through the channel of institutions. And uh, as you yes. know, British, the British set the standard for institutional for institutional development, as you are, as you know. They they were known for honesty, social capital, and because of social capital, it was easier to form businesses. This has been documented by many yes. scholars. Yes, it, it is true that that uh, on the whole, um, British colonial government. Um, did have a reputation, uh, especially I mean, classically in India, but also in Africa, for being populated by uh, British civil servants who had a very high standard of integrity. And, and um, I mean, one of the reasons that London uh, is a, a one of the world's leading financial capitals is because uh, investors trust institutions. They trust yes. the law, they trust the courts. And it was the same in the colonies that uh, one, one of the benefits of imperial rule is not only that it creates peace by, by uh, uh, pacifying uh, warring peoples, but it also builds institutions that investors can trust. And without, without that trust, investors are reluctant naturally uh, to risk their, their, their capital. The, the coffee house culture that's very important. British coffee houses, people met, they developed long lasting relationships and formed businesses. Social capital is linked to growth and many countries in Africa and the Caribbean are deficient in trust and social capital. Yes. J yes. Jamaica is a low trust state, according to polls. 
is not high in trust. And free market e economies tend to be linked to trust. So if you are building a pro-market e economy, it makes sense to nurture trust. Without trust, the gains become very small. Cambridge did this study. Do you have any idea what, what, what it would take in, in Jamaica to, to improve trust in, in uh, public institutions? Greater levels of efficiency, less corruption, and lastly, Jamaica may need a benevolent dictator who's committed to economic freedom and liberty. <laughs> this is what research shows. Countries like Jamaica need someone like Lee Kuan Yew. Huh. <laughs> poor, poor countries tend to, to, to improve when the leader is committed to development. But because people in countries like Jamaica tend to require charismatic authority, they're less likely to follow rules. It makes sense to create a benevolent dictator. Yeah. So a, a country like Jamaica needs charismatic authority buttressed by strong leadership. So, so, so what are the prospects of that? The prospects are extremely low because Jamaicans are sentimental people. They are too sentimental. So for example, the British offered to design a prison in Jamaica. It should have been a partnership between the British government and the Jamaican government. Both parties opposed it. And then when it became evident that Jamaica needs a modern prison facility, they tried to recant their original positions. But the issue is this, Jamaicans are sentimental. The people did not want the prison and the politicians succumbed to, to populism. F furthermore, Jamaicans should have asked themselves, why are so many people of Jamaican descent in England involved in criminal activities? If they were not criminals, the British would not have a reason to create a prison. It's just common sense. <laughs> but it's a very sentimental country and I'm not particularly sentimental. No, I, but, I gather that. <laughs> yes. But but Nigel, tell us about your latest book, Colonialism, a Moral Reckoning. Um, colon yeah, yeah, you wrote a book on colonialism. Tell us about no, it. That's right. Know. Right. Yeah. So I, I I just finished writing a book called Colonialism Moral, Moral Reckoning, Reckoning. Yeah. Which which will be published um I think in the spring of next year, 2022, by uh, William Collins. Uh, so in this book, I, um, um, I undertake a moral evaluation, uh, particularly of British colonialism, because as we pointed out earlier, um, uh, the critics focus on British colonialism. Why? Because actually, I think their target is not just British colonialism, their target is, is the West. Yes. And it's the, yes. it's the international order that is supported by America and to lesser extent the other Anglo countries, Britain, Australia, uh, New Zealand. Um, so that's the, why the focus is on uh, British colonialism. And in the book, I, I, I go through all of the major um, um, hot topics. So I start by discussing motives for empire. There's a chapter on uh, slavery, chapter on racism, chapter on land. Uh, one on economics, one on government, and finally one on violence. Um, and I, I, as honestly as I can, I deal with the bad bits and the good. Yeah. Um, but I, I end up concluding that uh, the British Empire, contrary to what many of the anti-colonialist critics want to say, uh, the British Empire had nothing Nazi about it. Uh, the Empire um, never presided over intentional genocide anywhere, not even in Australia. Um, and the empire, although, yes, uh, uh, the empire did preside over moments of exploitation, moments of racism, it was not essentially racist or exploitative. Um, and lo and behold, its, its legacy um, is uh, in, in the form of um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, uh, a range of the most prosperous and liberal countries in the world. And uh, of course, America, we didn't bring it up, but we did give birth to it. All right. Um, so so there's, 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 there's quite a good legacy there. All right. Uh, I, I, I believe that people will really appreciate 
our discussion and I plan to read your book, I can buy it or you may give me a free copy. Uh, uh, Lipton, if you, if, if you remind me, come, come the spring of next year when it's out, I will gladly give you, I'll send you a copy. Yes, but it was a pleasure to have you as a guest, Nigel. And at some point in the future, I may invite you again. All right. I, I, I'd yeah. love to do that. Yes. I hope to, hope to meet you in the flesh sometime. Yes, yes. Thanks for, thanks for showing up. And I expect people to really love us. I hope so. Yes.